Lord Jesus, we thank you that um, you have spoken, and we are reminded of that all the more during the Easter season, where we see at just the right time you spoke most clearly through the incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we look at the week ahead with Palm Sunday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, uh, we ask that we hear, we see, and we worship in ways that are unique given our current circumstances. For while the world is literally changing before us, the good news of what you've done to save sinners and restore us to God remains unchanged. And so, Lord, we pray that you make us a distinct people with a distinct message in this time. We pray this in your name. Amen. What is it that makes a Christian Christian? Seems like a simple question, but it's an important question. Because Jews believe in the God of the Old Testament. Muslims have no problem claiming that there's overlap between the God of the Bible and Allah. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, many spiritualists all affirm the existence of a God who might sound a lot like the God we as Christians claim to worship, claim to find in God's word. But what makes a Christian Christian is not simply a belief in a supreme, spiritual, omniscient God. It is specifically the work of Jesus Christ as fully man, and fully God, the second person of the Trinity. In fact, from a biblical perspective, to claim that you know God, but to not see the centrality of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, is to lock your spiritual keys in the cosmic car. You might know exactly where you need to go. You might know how to get there, and you might stand right at the door, but it's of no good to you. Unless you have the keys, you can't get any access to that. In our world today, such a claim might seem exclusive, might seem narrow-minded, but this is the biblical point. This is where the Bible, this is where God himself has hammered this into our hearts. We saw this last week when Johnny preached on Colossians chapter 1, where it says that if we want to see God, we must see that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the snapshot, the thing which we can look at, which John says, which we have seen, which our hands have touched. This we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. From Paul's perspective, to see Jesus is to see God. And to miss Jesus is to miss God. The week prior to that, we're in 1 Peter, and Peter says that it's only through the ransoming work of Jesus Christ that we can be uh, ransomed back from our futility to see God. It is through his work to save us from sins which blind our eyes and callous our hearts that Peter says, because of Jesus, our faith and our hope is in God. To not be one to Jesus is to have no faith in the biblical God. And this is why Christians celebrate and orient our calendars around this week, Holy Week, Easter. Easter reminds us of the centrality of how God has acted and called us to himself through Jesus, where Jesus reveals God and restores sinners through his work. And so what we're going to do for the next three Sundays and Good Friday is we're going to pause from our series through 1 Peter and we're going to look at several themes in Scripture which help us understand who Jesus is and how that shapes not only our view of a triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, but how it makes sense of our lives. There's nothing more practical than seeing God rightly. It changes things. And this change is needed because here we are on Palm Sunday, which is a day riddled with tension. Tension which can only be resolved through a right understanding of who Jesus is. Palm Sunday was the Sunday where Jesus and his disciples came and rode into Jerusalem, where only a few short days later he would be crucified. And yet, Palm Sunday includes what is called, not naively, the triumphal entry. In one sense, Palm Sunday sealed Jesus' death, but in another sense, it was triumphant. Why is that? What is the cause of the tension? Well, let's look at the text that Sean read earlier for us. As Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem, 
it, we pick up the story in Luke chapter 19, verse 35. And they brought it to Jesus. So the disciples are bringing the colt to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, that is to Jerusalem, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered them, I tell you, if these were to be silent, the very stones would cry out. So the reason why the crowds are excited, the reason why the Pharisees are frustrated, the reason why Jesus is coming knowing he's going to die, the reason why the stones themselves would cry out is because if Jesus is who he said he was, Jesus is the Lord's king. Our lives are riddled with tension. Tension in authority, tension in things we can't control. And that tension can only be resolved when we see the significance of Jesus, the king. But to get there, we need to make sense of a few things first. Because If the Pharisees actually understood the type of king that Jesus claimed to be, they probably would have worshipped him. And if the crowds understood the type of king that Jesus really came to be, they probably wouldn't have lauded him. It is so important for us to understand the kind of king that Jesus is. And so what we're going to do today is look at how the Bible, from the beginning to the end, talks about the idea of a king. And we're going to begin to make sense of it. First, we're going, to, we're going to do it in three ways. We're going to first make sense of the kingdom. Then we're going to make sense of the king. And we understand the nature of God's kingdom and the nature of God's king. Only then can we make sense of Jesus. And then because understanding Jesus changes things, we'll apply it to our life in closing. So first, let's see how the Bible makes sense of the kingdom. This is our first point, making sense of the kingdom. Now, we start talking about a kingdom we don't start talking about the king. Why is that? Because in a very real sense, this is where the Bible starts. And to be honest, in our own lives, it is our understanding of the kingdom which shapes any experience we have or any affection we have towards a king. There are dozens of countries in our world today that are ruled by a king, a queen, or some kind of monarchy. But you're not clamoring to go pledge allegiance to any of those nations. You're not clamoring to belong to any of those kings. Why is that? Probably because you feel pretty content here in America. All things present being excluded, maybe. (laughs) There's no desire in you to go to this kingdom. For many of us, the call to see Jesus as king is as simple as affirming that the king of Norway is, in fact, king of Norway. Could be true. He could be a great guy, but it doesn't really call me or compel me to move my family to Norway just to experience the kingdom of this king. But this is why, if we want to understand the beauty of the king, we also need to understand the significance of his kingdom. If following Jesus is disconnected from the kingdom of God, then Jesus will only at best be a novelty king. One, we might have a picture up in our home and we're appreciative of it. But in all real senses, we have a different authority in our lives. When we see the kingdom of Jesus, we see that it is not only far superior to anything this world offers, but it is also very literally what we were created for. This is where the Bible starts. Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. God created his own kingdom. The only king who has ever been able to create out of nothing a kingdom is God. And he created it. And distinctly and privileged inside of his kingdom, he created male and female. The Bible says, in his own image. You and me, the reason why we might puff out our chests. And my wife says I have a mirror face I make when I'm looking into the mirror. The reason why we make those faces is because we have royal blood in us. We see it. And it leaks out in all these different ways. We are made in the image of the king. And 
Look at how beautiful this kingdom was. If you look at Genesis, listen to the language that uh, Moses uses to describe this kingdom, this garden that God made. Genesis 2, we're going to begin in verse 8 and read through verse 15. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east. And there he put the man who he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden. There it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Hivala, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good, but Delam and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole of the land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east out of Assyria. And the fourth is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day you eat of it, you shall surely die. While this passage ends with a warning to Adam and Eve, what we see prior to that is the overwhelming beauty of this garden, don't we? Here we see this wonderful God. And at this point, if you're just picking up the Bible, we don't know much about God. It doesn't describe God, but it certainly describes his creation. Everything he made is pleasant. Everything he made is good. Everything he made is self-nurturing. The river waters the land. There's no need to haul hoses. There's no need to put in underground sprinklers. God has made this land perfect. And in it, he's created his people. Created a people not because he needed it, not because he had a lack for it, but he created a people because he wanted to fill this beautiful kingdom with people who bore his image. We see later on in the book of Genesis that God would walk with Adam and Eve in the garden. There was a perfect intimacy between the cosmic creator king and his vice regent creation. But inside of that, there was intimacy between male and female. It said that when Adam and Eve got married, they were naked and they were unashamed. Because there was nothing sinful. There was nothing silly. There was nothing scandalous about it. They were perfect together. And then we see they live in a perfect relationship with God, in a perfect relationship with each other, in this perfect garden where God had given every tree for them to eat from. There are four rivers to water the land. There is gold and bedillium. If you want that, it's all there. There's harmony with God, harmony with man, and harmony with nature. We all know, those of you who have kids know this even more during this quarantine stage, the law of entropy. That it doesn't matter how many times you clean the living room. By the end of the day, it's going to be in a state of disorder. Things go from order to disorder. That is natural. And yet, what a twisted reality of our hearts that we find a desire to fix it, to reorder it, to pursue harmony. Is it just that we are fundamentally stupid that we do those things, or is it because we are actually created to work for those things? Created to enjoy those things. Created to give our skills hearts and our hands to creating harmony with that which is around us. This garden kingdom was where God gave a good rule to Adam and Eve. A rule that made sense of their life. It gave them purpose. Fill it. Subdue it. Multiply inside of it. But also a rule for their protection. Don't eat of the one tree. Meaning we were made to live with God. That makes purpose in our lives. It brings us joy. It helps us belong. And it was a world free from death, free from sin, free from pain. But then a problem came. Adam and Eve were deceived into thinking that there was something better than this kingdom. God told Adam and Eve their greatest joy was that they would be with God. All of this harmony, all of this relational intimacy we have, this is what you need. You have everything you need here. But the serpent tried to convince them that their greatest joy was not to be with God, but to be God. That their greatest satisfaction was not having God as king, but their greatest satisfaction would come only when they would be king. And because of that, they disobeyed God. 
and they lost the kingdom. Why? That's a hard thing. For them to mess up once, to eat from the one tree God told them not to, and then to have all of this that we're about to see come crashing down. Why is it that such sin, such disobedience is treated so severely? Because in this sense where it is exclusive, unity, harmony with God, two people living there, a clear rule meant that disobedience was not a transgression, not a misstep. Disobedience was active rebellion. He said, I want what he has. And I'm going to take it into my hands to get it on my own. And so Adam and Eve rebelled. The Bible calls the fall. And in the fall, two things happened. Something internal and something external. Internally, sin invaded us. Sin disrupted our harmony. It shattered our relationships. The first thing Adam and Eve do is they hide from God. The second thing Adam does is he throws his wife under the bus. And the third thing that happens is the ground was cursed. Everything that was perfect became overwhelmingly complicated. And death came. Not in a physical sense. Not right now. Not immediately. God was gracious to do that. But in a spiritual sense, their relationship with God was shattered. And this led to this internal problem of a broken relationship led to an external one. We see this in Genesis 3, verses 23 through 24. Therefore the Lord God sent him, that's Adam, out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. There's an important word there. He's not just guarding the tree of life. He's guarding the way to the tree of life. Our sin removed us from the presence of God and keeps us from finding a way back. Because if we were to go back to such a holy God on our own, we would fall prey to the death penalty our sin deserved. We would be cut down because we are fundamentally broken. But the good news is that even though sin keeps us from making our way back to God, even though we rejected God, God did not forget about us. God set forth to fix what sin broke. And we need this because immediately after, and you guys, if you've been doing the F260 Bible reading plan, you've seen this, immediately after we're removed from the garden, We read about the ways in which man is utterly incapable of building anything close to a kingdom on his own. We read of murder, of arrogance, of pride, of betrayal. In fact, what's interesting is most enemies of religion would look at Genesis 4. Adam and Eve have been removed from God. They've severed that religious component, and they would say, now utopia starts. Right? This is what John Lennon, what we sing about, what all the celebrities are singing about on Twitter right now. Imagine that there's no countries. It's not hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion to. That's Genesis 4. There's no countries. There's no battle for property rights. There's no nagging God watching over the garden telling us what not to do. And yet in this utopia, the very first thing that happens is Adam and Eve's firstborn son kills their other son. And what's interesting here, if you read biographies, if you watch documentaries, it seems to be that those who, by worldly standards, have the most amount of control, whether through wealth or through power, are always the ones seemingly finding things spiraling out of control to protect their wealth, to cover up their crimes, to keep their family. Why is that? It's because we make lousy kings. You see, a broken relationship with God wasn't the end of humanity's problem. It was the beginning of it. Religion, in a good sense, a James sense, good religion is not the problem of humanity. It was the loss of a religion, a right relationship with God, which started the problem of humanity. And on our own, we couldn't do it. But in Genesis chapter 12, God enters back onto the scene. And he comes to this man who's going nowhere in particular, which is true of all of us when God comes to us. And he enters into a promise with him. He finds Abraham, and what was lost in Eden begins to be re-promised and recreated in the promise to Abraham. And look at this covenant in Genesis chapter 17. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8. 
And was eight, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord God appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you, throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So God promises here to Abraham, out of nothing, nothing compelled God. Humanity wasn't progressing towards righteousness. God came to Abraham and he said, listen, hear you. I am going to give you a land. I'm going to give you a place. We, we hear Eden. We hear the garden that we were taken care of, that we were taken out of, that sin separated us from. God was going to give us a place. But the other thing he promised was a nation. A nation where there would be kings. An everlasting nation. Why? Because if God was going to be their God and they were going to be his people, it was only natural that God would rebuild this kingdom through his king. For God to be our God, God rules us through his king. And God was promising himself to do it again. And this is what we saw in the book of Deuteronomy, right? These people, Abraham's people, they went into slavery in Egypt, and then Moses brings them out, and they're headed towards the promised land. In Deuteronomy, they're on the doorstep of the promised land. And look at what we saw in Deuteronomy 17. When it comes to living in the land, what does God warn them with? Beginning in verse 14. When you come to the land the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say... I will set a king over me, like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you, whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers you shall set as king over you. You may not put a foreigner over you, who is not your brother. Only he that is the king must not acquire many horses for himself, or cause the people to return to Egypt in order to acquire many horses. Since the Lord has said to you, you shall never return again that way. You see, even there, looking back at Genesis 3, God's making a new way. He's making a new way. You don't go back that way. I have a better way for you with my king. Nor shall he that's the king acquire for himself excessive silver and gold. And when he sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a, cop, in a book a copy of this law, approved by the priests, and it shall be with him. And he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping the words of this law and these statutes and doing them, that his heart might not be lifted up among his brothers or above his brothers, and that he might not turn aside from the commandment either to the right hand or to the left, so that he may continue long in his kingdom, he and his children in Israel. So the people are about to go into the land, and God says, this is what you need to know. This is the manner in which I'll care for you. God will give you a king. This is our second point today. This is beginning to make sense of the king. We see the kingdom, and we want the kingdom. We really do. In fact, every sin that attacks at your heart is preying off of shadows of the kingdom. Shadows of comfort, shadows of satisfaction, shadows of security, shadows of peace, unity, health, security, Goodwill to men. These are all universal desires because we were made for it. But we need a king to get us there. And because of that, we get a little angsty as people. We already are a little angsty just in election years. You could, you know, turn that up to level 11 by adding a global pandemic. And everyone is acutely aware that they need a king figure to help them. 
We are looking at governments, politicians, corporations, anything who promises to come and get us those glimpses of the kingdom, that peace, that health, that wealth, that security, and to actually bring it into our lives and make it a reality. And sometimes we can be all too careful to dismiss, the, or we could be all too quick to dismiss these hopes. Because the truth of the matter is that in these desires, we really have right desires. We have right hopes. And it is that hope that perhaps leads you to think that individual autonomy and liberty is what will see us through, or to whatever other type of government will see us through. But we want those things because we long for a proper ruler to make sense of our world because we know a ruler was created to make sense of our world. It's just that we so easily miss the nature. We miss the sense of the ruler which God himself said would come and help make sense of our rule. In Deuteronomy, God says, you're going to ask for a king, but listen to what I'm going to say. You're going to ask for a king because you really need it. You need a king. But it's me a king that I choose. A king from among your brothers. And he will be what we see in the rest of Deuteronomy 17. He'll be a good king. And not only will he be a good king, like Michael Jordan was a good basketball player, but he will be a good king, like a righteous king, an obedient king. The nature of him is that of goodness. Because it was Adam and Eve's disobedience which lost the kingdom, what we see in Deuteronomy 17 and what we see progressively throughout Scripture is it's going to be the obedience of the king who's now going to help establish the kingdom. This king we already saw in Deuteronomy 17, he's not going to use his power to assemble for himself great armies to boost his confidence. He's not going to be led astray by the allure of wealth and women. He won't exalt himself over his brother. Instead, what will he do? He will stay true to God's law. He will not veer to the right or to the left, but he will keep it and he will fear God. And what we see at the end of Deuteronomy 17 is that the good of the people is tied to the good of their king. As this king, the king we want, the king we need, the king we are made to desire, rules in the way God has called him to rule, it will go well with us in the land. This king will sit on his throne eternally. Sounds simple. So what do we do? We wait for God's king. The problem is we're terrible at waiting. (laughs) It's the hardest thing to do. And this is compounded all the more when you consider the physical world that God placed Israel into. God has now promised twice this this, uh, kingdom through his king. And then they continue on through Joshua. They continue on through Deuteronomy. And what do they see? Edom has kings. Moab has kings. The Ammonites, the Philistines, the Hivites, the Hittites, they all have kings. But there was seemingly no king in Israel, no king they could point to, no grand palace from which to draw their strength. And what this led Israel to do, if you've been reading in our Bible reading plan, is it led Israel to pursue false kings and the gods of false kings, kings they could see and idols they can touch. And it led them to sin. So what does God do? He doesn't immediately send a physical king. God is still their king. The problem is they forget it. And so what God does is he sends these judges, and these judges would come, and they would remind people of God as king. And the people would be like, you're right, we have sinned, we repent, we want to pledge our allegiance to God. They go back to God, the judge dies, and they enter right back into sin. And this is a cycle we see over and over and over again. Those who are in our Bible reading group, um, we actually only read a few chapters in Judges in going through it. But I often say Judges is the most depressing book in all of the Bible. It ends with some of the most cringeworthy, disgusting acts of depravity. And we say, why? Why are we reading this? Why is this included in God's word? Well, we see why in the very last verse of Judges. Judges 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. They had God's law. They had his good rule that would protect them. They had judges who called them to God, but without the visible and present king, God's people showed that they are too weak to be his people. 
and they disobeyed, and it did not bring flourishing. It did not make them look like the other nations. It brought pain and death. So finally, the people are tired of the judges, and they take matters into their own hands. And they go to Samuel, who was a prophet and judge, in Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 8, and this is what we read in verses 4 through 9. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you're old, and your sons don't walk in your ways. There we see the problem. Even we have a judge, a good judge like Samuel, but he's getting old, and his kids aren't faithful. What's going to happen for that faithful lineage, those faithful rulers? Because you're old and your sons don't walk in your ways, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. But this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people in all they say to you. For they have not rejected you as judge, but they have rejected me from being king over them. According to all the deeds that I have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, solemnly obey their voice. You shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who will rule over them. So Israel, just like Moses predicted in Deuteronomy 17, Israel demands a king, but not on God's timeline on their timeline. That's where we always get into trouble. The problem is not often that we don't want things that God wants. The problem is that we want things that God wants us to want, but we want them on our own timeline and not on God's timeline. And this is what happens next. Verses eight through, or 18 through 20. 19 through 20. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. This text is important. Why is it that you want a king? You might say to yourself, because you're realistic, we're modern people, I don't really want a king. But while we won't use that language, we have the same desires of Israel. Israel wanted to look like the other nations, the ones who had picture-perfect Instagram feeds of their king and their kingdom. We want someone to fight our battles for us. Israel didn't want a king so that they might look like God's kingdom. They wanted a king so they might look like the world's kingdom. So that they might have all of their battles solved. And we know that temptation. What's really behind Israel's request are, again, right desires, but misplaced hopes. Hopes. They don't want to feel like outsiders. They don't want to have this awkward, ugly distinction between them and us. And they don't want to live in fear. They want someone who could fight their battles for them. They want, they want belonging. They want someone who can deal with problems they can't. Those are good desires, but good desires spent in wrong places lead us to bad things. This is what drives all of our sin. It's what drives us to bad relationships, foolish relationships. We think that this other person can fight our battles for us. If we have this person, this will be solved. This is why we cave to sin in our isolation. It's why we cave to sin in our homes and in our anger. Because we think that sin can come and whisper in our words, the thing we would want a king to whisper when enemies are mounting at our gates. Stay near to me and I'll take care of you. I've got this handled. Just stay near to me. What I love is as 1 Samuel goes on, God is guiding this whole process. He's doing this so that we might see the kind of king that should come, the kind of king we ought to wait for. But God goes and Uh, He tells Samuel to anoint Saul, and there's this formal swearing-in ceremony of King Saul. And Samuel calls Saul to come and stand before the people. And there's this awkward moment, even worse than Saul, forgetting to unmute his microphone. Saul doesn't even come. Samuel's like, behold your king. And no one comes up. Why? It says because Saul is hiding among 
the luggage. Saul, the one who these people hoped would fight their battles for them, is too scared to even stand before his own people. And yet when, when Samuel finally coaxes him to come out and he stands before Israel, Israel's like, oh, he's tall. <laughs> they immediately forget of his cowardice and they just see how tall he is and they say, behold our king. We know we need a good king to rule us, a good king to bring us peace. And yet none of us in the history of the world have shown that we found one. But it hasn't stopped us from recycling the kings of the world has it. Though its failures may have been shown, hiding among the luggage, when it finally stands before us, we see how tall it is. We see how strong it is, how snazzy, how digital, how crisp, how attractive, and we immediately begin to think, oh, this will work out nicely. This time, this is the guy. But this never works. It's God's grace to show us this. After Israel demands a king, it's not even a page and a half in your Bible before Saul has failed as king. And God has withdrawn his presence from him. But then David comes. And David, after a long process of running from Saul, finally becomes king. And he's a king after God's own heart where Saul failed. David succeeds. So much so that God narrows his promise. The promise that was to Abraham... The promise in Deuteronomy is now narrowed to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 10 through 16. This is what God says to David. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so they may dwell there in their own place and be disturbed no more, and violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. Do you hear Eden? It's here. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father. He shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, your throne will be established forever. God narrows and reaffirms his promise. God was going to give Israel its place. God was going to give Israel its ruler. Someone from David's line would sit on the throne, not for a season, but eternally. Eden was finally coming back. It was right around the corner, it seemed. The guy is here. This is the dude. But then, again, as is common in the Old Testament, a couple pages later, and David falls. David, their king, the man after God's own heart, forcefully takes the wife of another man, sleeps with her, impregnates her, and has her husband murdered to cover up his own sin. Certainly, this is not what God's king would look like. Even after him, his son Solomon, next in line, perhaps this is the one. All the things Deuteronomy says don't do, Solomon checks off perfectly, surrounds himself with thousands of wives, immense wealth, elevates himself among his brother. And what's interesting is we see through the rest of Scripture the sin of God's king. And the sin hurts God's people. It was the sin of David that led ultimately to the kingdom being divided into in a bloody civil war. The northern kingdom separated into Israel, the southern kingdom separated into Judah, and lives were lost because of the sin of the king. During this divided kingdom, though, there was hope. God said that even though someone from David's line would sin, he would be disciplined, but God would not remove his steadfast love. And we see that is during this divided kingdom, there's a prophecy that God will keep his covenant. God will bring his king. Look at Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That is a good thing that we want of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. The promise was there. But not long after Isaiah prophesied this, the northern tribe of Israel was completely lost from history, captured and assimilated by the Assyrians. Not long after, Judah was taken captive by Babylon. But even in Judah's captivity, there are prophets like Ezekiel who who spoke and predicted of a restored Jerusalem, a new temple, a new ruler. God had still not forsaken his people. And then you can imagine Israel's hope as King Cyrus finally lets exiles go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall, to establish the city, to build the temple. And the last part of the Old Testament, the temple is built, the walls are established, the city restored, yet the kings are shadow kings. There's no kingdom. There's no immense city of God. It has all of the shape, but none of the substance. So ends the Old Testament with the question, where's the king? Where's the king? And this is what makes a triumphal entry so triumphant. Matthew 1 opens with the genealogy of Jesus, things we often skip past, and it says, this Jesus is from the line of David. The good line. The eternal line. And what is this message of Jesus's ministry? Mark 1.15, Jesus says this, says the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Jesus came as a connection to God's kingdom plan. And only now do we get to our last point, only now can we begin to make sense of Jesus. This is our third point. To make sense of Jesus is to see Jesus not just as Savior, not just as Messiah, but as King, as Ruler, as Lord, as what we have always been waiting for. Jesus was the King who in God's perfect timing finally came to rebuild the kingdom. And like Adam, who was tested by the devil, And fell, Jesus was tested by the devil and obeyed. He was the king. Here he was, who was not only going to know the law like Moses said, but he was going to fulfill the law. He was going to obey God perfectly in ways the kings of the past never could, in ways where the kings of the past disobeyed and it brought death. This king was going to obey, but it too was going to bring death. Why? Why is this triumphal entry culminating in the death of a king? That seems like an absolutely terrible king. But let me go back for a moment to the reign of David. In the end of David's kingdom, he was filled with arrogance. He commanded a census. Why does he command a census? Seems like a silly thing. We're in a census year. We're being counted. Well, David commanded a census because he wanted to boast in the size of his kingdom. He was wanting to elevate himself, feel good about himself. Look at how many people I rule over. But this was a sin. And God does something kind of unprecedented in Scripture. In 2 Samuel 24, God goes to David and he says, David, I'm going to punish you. I'm going to give you three options. You're going to pick one. It's unique. And God says, option one, there's going to be three years of famine in the land. Option two, you will run for three months while your enemy physically pursues you. Option three, there will be pestilence in your land. David basically says, anything but option two. Don't let me fall into the hands of men who want to kill me. Famine in the land, pestilence in the land, whatever, that's the Lord's business. Don't put me in danger at the hands of men. So what happens next is that God brings pestilence on Israel. 70,000 people die. Because David feared himself being pursued, the lives of his own people were lost. David realizes this. He has this sobering moment 
And he goes to God and look at what he says in 2 Samuel 24, verse 17. Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Behold, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. David realized that at Israel's king, he should suffer instead of them. Why? Because it was his own sin. And that's what a good king would do. And this is why Jesus triumphantly came to die. Not because he had any sin, for he had no sin of his own. Jesus was the representative king Israel needed, the king who finally kept the law, the king who was sinless. But his people were not. While Jesus had no sin, we do. We have no access to the kingdom so long as we reject the king. The way is guarded. There is no way back. The truth is there is nothing that keeps you from entering into God's kingdom except for the blindness and hostility of your own heart. And that is a battle you cannot win. But this is why Jesus is far more than our representative king, our righteous king who obeyed in our place. But Jesus is also the true and better David, the substitute king who would willingly give up his life in our place, dying for our unrighteousness. As good as David was, we see that he is not this kind of king in 2 Samuel 24. But look at what our king, the king whom God chose, the king whom God sent at the right time, the king who would restore all things. Look at how he's described in Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. Have this among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, not elevating himself above his brother. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient where we couldn't, to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It is this King and this Lord who brings us back to the glory of God, the God that our sin separated us from. This is the king you are waiting for. Because as the Garden of Eden shows, our greatest problem is not enemy occupation or a global health crisis or taxation or poverty or climate change. Our greatest problem is the sin that separates us from God. Sin which our king came to give his life for so that we can once again be brought back to the presence of the garden. That the cherubim has been removed because blood has been spilled on the sword of judgment so that we can have access to the life that we willingly rebelled against. Jesus is the king who has fought the battle for you and restores true belonging not to the world but to God. Jesus defeats the death in our hearts. Jesus is the Savior we need. He's the one who fought what we couldn't to bring us where we couldn't get. So what does this mean in closing? How do we apply this to our lives? Two things. First, we recognize this king. How do you recognize a king? The Bible makes it clear in this case. You can't recognize who Jesus is. You can't see the kind of king who Jesus is and not repent of the ways where you have tried to live as king on your own. We respond to this king. We turn from our sin by repenting and believing the gospel. And this is a really hard thing for us to understand. 
we have what C.S. Lewis calls chronological snobbery. Here we are in 2020 being broadcast magically over the internet and space. Don't know how any of it works. But here we are. We are so technologically advanced that to talk about Christ as king, to use language like this, seems fairy taleish. It seems so distant. It seems so irrelevant to us. And so even as Christians, we wrestle and we say, yes, Christ is king. But we don't have, we are so removed even historically from an understanding of what it is to be ruled by a king. But the truth is that though we now live in America in a democratic republic, we will all one day live under divine monarchy. This is no fairy tale. This is not a neat descriptive word to establish the authority of Jesus. You will be judged in relationship to this king. On your own, you are an enemy of the kingdom. And if left unaddressed, you will be treated as such. But by grace, this king came and laid down his life so that you might become a friend of the kingdom. If you're not a believer in here today, I want you to hear that the battles in this life will wear you out. Because you are made for a kingdom like this, you will live for a kingdom like this. Meaning that you will either labor in your life to build this kingdom on your own, or you will seemingly try to work your way back into God's kingdom, and those will crush you. And I don't want to assume that Christians don't think that same way as well. But here, Jesus has fought that battle for you. It is Jesus' work who has said, come back by my obedience. Come back by repentance. Come and gain what only I can give. He died so that you might repent, that is to turn away, believe, and be restored to God. He solves the internal problem. We have peace, and that gives us an external hope. Or just as we sang in a mighty fortress, though the devil seems to work his woe, we know the one who holds the victory. That one day Christ will establish, as we'll see in the next few weeks, a new kingdom. And not only will our internal reality be changed, but our external reality will, will be changed. We'll be brought back to the place where sin has been defeated and death has been destroyed. Faith in Jesus is what makes a Christian Christian. Secondly, we not only recognize the king, we respond to the king. When Jesus becomes our king, our life as citizen of his kingdom is only beginning. And this means that we now have the privilege of responding in three ways. We hail the king, we herald the king, and we hope in the king. We hail the king because he's worthy of worship. We make much of him because we have seen his beauty and we say, this is my king. This calls our life to obedience. It causes our hearts to sing praises. And I understand that be, even though the internal reality is fixed, the external reality isn't. And because of that, because of circumstances in our world, because of the fullness of our heart, worship is hard. It is. Even for the, the most Christian Christian, it's hard. It's supposed to be. We, we have anticipation when it won't be. And this week, if you wrestle with worship, I want to encourage you to do two things. To first pray. Pray that God would give you eyes to see the glory of this king. Read Philippians 2 and see this. This king is above all other names. Secondly, this Easter week, I encourage you with your family, with someone over uh, Skype or Google Hangout, to read through the Gospel of Mark and notice the kind of kingdom that this king brings and hope in that. That's the hope we have of this king. That for us in our weaknesses, for us in our calamities, for us in our world, there's always hope. Because Jesus has an inheritance for us, kept in heaven, waiting again for God's time. Jesus has shown that the king is worth waiting for. And the New Testament shows that the kingdom is worth waiting for. We also herald the king. We have what the world wants. And so we have the joy of inviting others to see this kingdom not that we have built, not that you can earn, but that Christ's body has purchased. And this is a unique season this Easter 
Uh, it's a season where a lot of us are removed from gathering, but it's also a season where in our country and in our world at levels unprecedented in our lifetimes, people are aware of the reality of death and life. We have the king our hopes have been waiting for. Herald him. Make him known in the relationships you have. Talk to the person on the other side of the plexiglass window at the checkout stand. Give hope to the hopeless. Invite people to our live stream on Sunday. It sounds so silly. Man, how I wish we could invite them to church. How I wish we could do that right now. But this is for God's glory that he has us here right now. And we as heralds of this kingdom are hopeful heralds proclaiming that this is sufficient in this time of need. Christ is our king, and that's what we've been waiting for. So let's worship. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you have come, the long-awaited Jesus, the good king, the king who is good in his nature and good in his rule, the king who is spending his time building a kingdom beyond our imagination, a king who opens our eyes to the glory of God, by dying for our sins. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful. We pray that you help us to recognize your rule and repent. We pray you help us to respond with worship, obedience, and joyful proclamation. We pray all these things because we have seen that God has sent his king at the right time for his glory and for our good. 